The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Andy Duncan, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to this Gold Money Podcast on Tuesday the 12th of February 2013, the 100th Gold Money Podcast. We've had some great guests on the last 99 shows and today is no exception because today I'm privileged to be speaking to the author of The Machinery of Freedom, economist, physicist and all-round polymath, Professor David Friedman. Hello, David. Hello. We've been living in a totally fiat money experiment since 1971 when Richard Nixon closed the gold window on the US dollar. How do you think this experiment is going? Well, there have been worse times and there have been better times. The U.S., at least, has not had a hyperinflation yet, so we're doing better than the German or Hungarian experiments of a while back. Uh, on the other hand, prices have been a good deal less stable than they were in the 19th century when there was more or less a real gold standard. So do you think there's going to be a hyperinflation then? No, nope. I could be wrong, but my guess is not. Miss Shedlock is somebody who believes in a great deflation. Do you think there'll be a deflation or will things just stay the way they've been, say, in Japan for the last 20 years, sort of completely flat? I would be surprised if the price level went either up or down by more than 10% a year any time in the next few years. I could be wrong. It's not a subject I'm a specialist on, but I think the extreme predictions are usually wrong. How do you think we're going to get out of the current economic malaise then? Do you think that we'll see a, a breakdown in central banks' monopoly on money, or will things just continue the way they are? I think predicting that things will continue the way they are is probably the most likely prediction. As you may know, back in the 18th century, after one of the American victories in the Revolutionary War, uh, one of Adam Smith's students came to him and he said, Mr. Smith, this will be the ruin of England. And Smith's reply was, young man, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. And I think that's true of, of, of most things, that the present monetary system is not what I regard as the ideal one. Uh, but insofar as there's a serious threat to it, I think it's likely to be technological rather than its internal collapse. I think there is at least some possibility that some decent form of uh, e-cash is going to get uh, established in the course of, I suppose, the next couple of decades. And that might possibly end up replacing government monies. But I think that the idea that the fiat system works so badly it's going to collapse doesn't have very much support. Now, in the last week, we've seen the introduction of the Amazon coin e-money. Do you think this is a sign of the trend that you're sort of describing there? Uh, and could something like that even become a kind of dominant currency if it if it takes hold? Uh, I haven't. Re I've heard of that, but I've not really followed it, so I can't say much about it. Uh, I think the most interesting one, which I don't really understand well enough to thoroughly explain, is Bitcoin, because that's a decentralized system which doesn't depend on having a reliable bank or equivalent to redeem it. It's not clear to me if the Amazon coin is more than just. Uh, a single merchant's uh, uh, sort of pseudo money, but we'll have to see. But I suppose it's possible that something like that could take off. Now, you've got a PhD in physics and you say you don't understand Bitcoin, so that doesn't really leave much hope for the rest of us. Do you think we, as well as Bitcoin, do you think we could see things like commodity bundle kind of money appear? It's certainly possible. The problem is that one of the desirable features of a money is that it's the same money that other people use. And that puts quite a lot of inertia into the system. So that even though something like the dollar is not a terribly good money, I think it has to get a good deal worse than it is before people are likely to switch, unless there's some substantially superior version, such as a anonymous e-cash, say, which would have some real, real advantages over the dollar. So my preferred system, uh, which, as you probably know, I've, I've discussed in, in writing, would be a fractional reserve commodity bundle currency. I think that makes more sense than the other mechanism I can think of, but I'm not predicting that it's going to happen. 
Now, some in the Austrian school, maybe uh, the kind of Auburn, Alabama people in the Austrian school would be very opposed to fractional reserve banking. Why do you think it's a valid system? I think it is valid in three different senses. It can work and historically has worked on various occasions, including private competing fractional reserve banks. It, as far as I can tell, has no moral problems, despite what seem to me arguments people fudge up to claim it does. And if you have a free market in money, I think it is the most likely thing to emerge, that a 100% reserve bank uh, has the problem that it's got to charge people for using its money because it's got no revenue source, whereas a fractional reserve bank, in effect, is getting a free loan from the people who hold its money. Uh, if it has a 10% reserve, then 90% of the money it puts out can get used to buy interest-bearing assets, uh, and therefore it can afford to provide its money for free. In principle, if it's mechanically practical, it can even pay interest on its money, which is what checking accounts uh, routinely do now. It's hard to compete when somebody else has technology that provides the same services at a substantially lower cost. So I think that in a free market, the 100% reserve banks are going to disappear. If you do see that the current monetary situation is going to last into the indefinite future, how, how do you think we are going to break it down and get towards private monies and private competing currencies? Well, as, as I said, the one place where I can see a reasonable chance of that is if somebody can establish a e-cash, ideally an anonymous e-cash, uh, which was convenient and widely available. And that could happen, that a lot of commercial activity is moving to the internet, has moved to the internet. And the more of that is there, the greater the advantages to a currency that works well online. And there are obvious reasons why a lot of people would prefer that they be able to make expenditures that other people can't observe. And from that standpoint, an anonymous e-cash would be superior to the present PayPal credit card, the various ways we now make payments online. So I think really the only the only path that seems to me very likely is the one which comes not through a collapse of the present system, which I would expect to work about as well as it's worked for the last 40 years, which is tolerably well, though not perfectly, but through the introduction of some superior substitute. So you don't think gold and silver monies are going to replace what we currently have them? I'd be surprised if they did, yes. I think that those were technologies that made quite a lot of sense in the past, but that given a, a modern society where there are pretty good ways of making sure that the person whose paper money you're using really has the assets to back it. Uh, now, the, the, the one real advantage of a gold or silver coin, especially gold, is that it's pretty easy to check that it's real. Uh, gold had characteristics that couldn't be readily copied because it's the densest of the commonly available metals. Therefore, you could pretty easily test that something was really gold uh, but that's not really necessary if uh, you have a well enough functioning uh, economy so that you can test that this particular piece of paper really is a claim that somebody will fulfill if you bring the paper into them. Okay, I've got to ask you this because you might understand that a lot of the people listening to this podcast will be believers in gold money. Now, if the, the World Bank, the IMF and the G20 all got together and did announce some kind of new world gold standard, perhaps run by a world government body such as the UN, what would your opinion be of that? I would be reluctant to trust the UN to run a monetary system. But also, when you say a gold system, are you describing a fractional reserve gold system uh, or a 100% reserve gold system? Because they're quite different things. I would imagine a fraction, it would be a fractional reserve system, wouldn't it? Yes. And then I guess the question is, would you be more inclined to trust uh, the UN to run such a thing than the US government or better still, uh, some private uh, bank. Oh, I'd personally much prefer a private bank. Yes, but I'd also prefer the US government to the UN. I think it is a probably a somewhat uh, more honest and less corrupt organization. But in any case, I don't see any very good reason why you have to have a single money. So if you're talking about making what you'd like to see, uh, what I would like to see would be multiple competing currencies ideally with the issuers standardizing on a single definition of what their money is 
much so that normally the currencies would exchange at one for one. And that's basically what the Scottish system of for 150 years or so uh, was with private issuers whose money was all defined in terms of silver, but was in fact only fractionally uh, backed. Moving on to other things. In the last few years, we've seen a, a huge increase in kind of state power across the entire Western world. Uh, and this seems to go against a kind of sweep of history in the last two or three hundred years of increasing liberty. Do you think that this increase in state power is a kind of minor temporal blip, or is it more of a long-term reversion to the kind of serfdom era that uh, followed the Roman Empire? Yeah, to begin with, I don't think there has been a huge increase in state power. I think there has been an increase in state power in the U.S., uh, maybe in Europe, I don't know. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you compare China at present to China 30 years ago, that's a very striking decrease in state power. If you compare India now to India 30 years ago, I would guess that that's also a more modest decrease. Uh, those two countries between them have a lot more human beings in them than the US and Europe do. So I don't think I would be willing to accept your generalization about the world. What I think is the important question to which I don't know the answer is whether the increase in the US represents a trend which will continue or a deviation from trend that'll be corrected. And I don't think that I have a clear enough picture of what really drives American politics to make, make predictions, that clearly there are a lot of people who are unhappy with the change. There are other people who are in favor of it. I also am not sure I'm willing to accept your picture of history. I would have said that it's not at all clear that the shift from feudalism to absolute monarchy represented a reduction in state power. On the contrary, I think it represented an increase in state power. So I think if you look at it, things have gone back and forth in various places at various times for quite a long, a long while. Uh, furthermore, if you look just at the size of government, uh, it's the big increase is from the 19th century to the present, not the last few years. That for the U.S. and U.K. at least, in the 19th century, all governments combined spent about 10% of national income. Currently, all governments combined spend something like 30 to 50% of national income, depending on the country. So that represents a sizable increase in state power, not a decrease. Looking into the kind of longer term of places like Europe, um, we, we see tensions in places like Scotland and Catalonia and various other countries that want to break away from, say, the nation states of the United Kingdom and Spain. Do you think that the euro area is likely to break up into smaller units and possibly even, it might seem very unlikely, do you think it's possible for the United States to break up into smaller units, into maybe even 50 different countries? I think it's very unlikely that the United States will. It might be a good idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, in the case of Europe, you've really got trends going in both directions, that on the one hand, there's the push from Brussels to turn Europe into something more like the United States. On the other hand, that's obviously resisted in a lot of countries. And as you say, there are a number of countries where there is a, a good deal of sentiment at the regional level uh, for breaking up. I think it's unfortunate that the EU has taken the position that if Catalonia secedes, it'll have to reapply for membership in the EU. The process will take quite a long time and thus secession would be quite disruptive from an economic standpoint. I think it would make much more sense to say, once you've got a common market, now the economic advantages of staying inside a country are much less, and therefore we will make it easier for regions that where a lot of people are unhappy with the government they now have to secede. And, uh, but EU is not, in fact, going that direction, unfortunately. The direction of freedom uh, is going in various directions in various places. It, again, in your book, Machinery of Freedom, you talk about two mechanisms towards taking us towards greater freedom. The first, which is uh, education and educating people about it. And the second, which is providing services which people think can only be done by the state, such as UPS and Federal Express doing, uh, doing the work of US mail. Where do you think we stand um, in a global direction on the path towards a future of greater liberty? I think on the idea side that we've made progress over my lifetime, say over the last 50 years, it's a little less than my lifetime, but most of it, my adult lifetime. But on the other hand, 
in a sense, it's not a battle you can ever win. Uh, I don't know if you're a reader of uh, Lord of the Rings, but there's quite a striking passage near the end of it where somebody is saying basically, yes, we have defeated this evil enemy, but there's no way that you can guarantee that further things won't happen, that we, 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 not, no victories are permanent. And in that sense, I think at the intellectual level, we defeated socialism. I think there are many, many fewer people who are willing to argue that a centrally planned economy works better than a market economy now. At the same time, uh, environmentalism, I think, has become a much more uh, influential ideology, which to some extent is doing the same work socialism did, that is providing arguments for governments interfering with things people want to do. Uh, so that's a sort of another and, and different problem. But on the whole, I would say that intellectually we've made progress. That in, if you think, let me take, go back again to the case of India or China. If you are the government of India, if you are a powerful politician in India in, say, the 1950s or 1960s, you believe that you have a win win situation. That the same policies that will increase your power and your income, namely increasing how much requires government permission to do, will also result in your country developing, getting richer, so you will be the ruler of a richer country. Uh, that wasn't true. And I think at this point, practically nobody believes it's true. So that at this point, if you were the, a ruler of China or India, you realize that you have a trade off, that the same policies that increase how much control you have over your country, also decrease how valuable that control is because they result in the country staying poor instead of getting rich. And I think that's been a very important change, and that's largely, though not entirely, responsible for the fact that things in countries where it used to have very strong governments now have only moderately strong governments. I'm one of those few people who thought the recent Hobbit movie was actually far too short at three hours and should have been four hours. So yes, I've uh, read The Lord of the Rings. Now, one of the things I think was a great uh, tool in helping us increase freedom in the last 50 years was your book, The Machinery of Freedom. Now, the copy I've got on my hands now, I think, was a 1989 edition. It's freely available on your site now, daviddfriedman.com, to download as a PDF. But are we going to see another revision soon, or do you think your book still stands? Both. That is... I am working on a third edition. I don't think there is anything substantial in the first and second editions that I now think is wrong, but there are things which I understand better uh, and which I think I can explain better, and there are certainly uh, some points I missed that I think are, are, are worth, worth discussing. How soon that will be done, I don't know. Uh, I've got drafts, I think, of most of the chapters. As you may know, it's partly a copyright issue that... Open Court published the second edition. Uh, under my contract with them, if the book went out of print for a certain length of time, the copyright was supposed to revert to me. It's not at all clear what out of print means nowadays, that in fact there was a period of several years when it was print on demand. If you wanted to buy a copy that what they basically said is, we'll print you up a copy, but you may have to wait a couple of months. I'm not sure if that's out of print or not. I would be happy to have them do a third edition. I would be happy to have them give me the copyright back so I could do a third edition. So far, I haven't gotten them to do either of those things. The closest I came was to get permission to web the PDF of the second edition. My current plan, if I can't work out something with open court, is that I will simply write the additional chapters and put them up on my website, and then you can download the second edition, and you can download part five, uh, since the second edition has four parts, which will be the additional material for the third edition. Well, I look forward to that. I also believe that you're uh, you're a novelist as well. You've written a couple of novels. Um, how, how's your novelist career going? Well, that's interesting. Uh, neither of them was a bestseller, alas. On the other hand, I have gotten some feedback that I like. The first novel was commercially published by Bain, which is a fairly well-known science fiction fantasy publisher. It wasn't really a fantasy, though that was how it was marketed, because there wasn't any magic in it. What it really was was a historical novel with made-up history, and it had certain limitations. There are things that I think I did wrong in it, but on the whole, I still like it, and at least some of the people who read it liked it. It wasn't successful enough to make Bain want to do a second one, 
So my second novel, which really is a fantasy because it actually has magic in it, uh, in fact, I think one of the things I like about it is that I believe I have an original version of magic, and that one I essentially self-published. I really had my agent publish it uh, as a Kindle on Amazon. That one's called Salamander. And the main thing I've gotten out of that, I haven't made much money out of either book. The main thing I've gotten on the second is that the reviews on Amazon, which are almost all quite positive, include some where it is clear that the reader got the stuff I was hoping readers would get, as it were. And that's sort of one of the payoffs for, for writing, writing novels. There's a one review in particular where the reader essentially says, this is the book you have to pay attention to. In the following scene, this particular line only makes sense if you're thinking about how the situation looks for the various characters. And he's completely right. And it was a passage where I was worried I might be being too subtle and was glad to see that at least for one reader I wasn't. When you write novels, it's, it's for each reader one at a time, isn't it? Anyway, thank you very much for your time today, Professor Friedman. It's been fascinating talking to you. And uh, I look forward to reading part five of The Machinery of Freedom. I look forward to finish writing it. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. Music.